Okay, why don't we start? Uh, I would like to welcome all to the 2021 ASLIP Presidential Address. My name is Jungmin Lee, a professor of economics at Seoul National University, Korea. I'm very glad to chair this uh, very special session. Uh, I'm extremely honored to introduce our president, uh, Professor Christian Dustman. Uh, Christian is a professor of economics at University College London, and he is the director of the Center for Research and Analysis of Migration, CRAM, CRIM, I don't know how you correctly pronounce it. Uh, he is one of the top renowned scholars in labor economics and especially topics about immigration. He has published his papers at top journals such as American Economic Review, Quarterly Journal of Economics, Journal of Political Economy, uh, Review of Economic Studies, and Journal of Labor Economics. Uh, recognizing his contributions, academic contributions, he is an elect elected fellow at British Academy, Society of Labor Economists, the Academy of Europe, and the German National Academy of Sciences. He has been recently elected as fellow of the Econometric Society. Uh, congratulations. Uh, he has tremendously contributed to the Academy, Academia of Labor Economics. He was the president of the European Association of Labor Economics, and he was also the president of the European Society for Population Economics. As we all know, uh, Christian is the founding president of our society. I have seen uh, from the beginning how much time and energy he has sacrificed uh, in order to establish uh, our society as strong as it is now. I have no doubt without his help, uh, our society, this wonderful society couldn't even exist. So without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce uh, ASLE founding president, Professor Christian Dusman. The floor is yours, Christian. Thank you very much, Jungmin. Um, well, I am, not anymore the president, the new president of the society is Jiang Min. Uh, and uh, congratulations, Jiang Min. Jiang Min has been, uh, well, uh, with us from the very start. Uh, and I could also say that his contributions to the society have been tremendous. I remember when we needed a venue for the second uh, meeting uh, and the venue we had in mind uh, couldn't be realized, Jiang Min uh, immediately uh, came forward and uh, suggested Seoul as an alternative, and we had a wonderful conference in Seoul. So uh, I'm sure that Jiang Min will uh, bring the society to new heights um, during his presidency, and I'm extremely pleased uh, that he is uh, taking over. Uh, so let me come straight to, to my talk. Um, I will change to my PowerPoint, and um, I hope everybody can uh, can see that. Um, I would like to talk about, well, I just realized I only have 45 minutes instead of um, uh, 60 minutes, which I uh, designed the talk for. So I will be a little bit fast on particular slides. Uh, I would like to talk about something which uh, many of you may have uh, worked on, uh, the impact of immigration uh, on uh, regions uh, and workers. and. Uh, before I continue, let me first uh, acknowledge that this is joint work with Sebastian Otten, Uta Schönberg, uh, and uh, Jan Struhler. Now, a key question in the public debate on immigration is how does immigration affect the welfare of residents in the receiving country? And as labor economists, we usually think about immigration as a labor supply shock. Uh, the literature, uh, which is now vast, uh, has investigated uh, this shock uh, on 
uh, among others, wages and employment. And wages and employment will be the two outcomes I will focus on uh, in this particular talk. But much of what I will uh, try to say today uh, will uh, apply to other outcomes as well. Uh, what we do in this paper uh, is to show that the effects of immigration on these outcomes, again, we will focus on wages and employment, as they are identified in much of the literature, may measure uh, often different parameters uh, than those that are stated. And that actually matters quite uh, dramatically uh, for the way uh, we interpret uh, our estimates. Uh, let me give you some motivation. Uh, consider, for instance, immigration's effect on the employment of native uh, workers. One uh, important worry in the public debate is that immigration endangers the jobs of employed native workers uh, and that prompts usually the question what is the impact of immigration on workers who are employed in a particular region when immigration happens now by regressing and that's what the majority of papers in this literature is doing by regressing the changes in regional employment of natives on immigrant inflows estimates an effect which is not the effect that addresses the above question, but it is an effect uh, that uh, answers another question. And that question is, what is the impact of immigration on regional employment? If you kind of think about that a little bit, you will see these questions are actually very different. But if you don't think deeply about it, they seem extremely similar. Nevertheless, the answers to these questions can be dramatically different. And then the application to which I will come in the second part of my talk, uh, I will show you that, uh, well, a 10 percentage point increase in immigration decreases employment of those who were in work when immigration happened, which is the first question by 1.5%, but it decreases regional employment by 8.7%. So dramatically different numbers for two questions which seem very similar and at least in the public debate are not properly distinguished. Um, similar issues, of course, arise when assessing immigration's effects on wages. Uh, wages are usually interpreted as a shift of the labor supply curve down the labor demand curve. And we talk or we call that a price effect uh, of immigration in uh, this paper. Uh, most papers, however, estimate the change in regional wages in response to an immigration shock. However, regional wages are a composite of the price effect, which is the shift of the labor supply curve down the labor demand curve on native wages, uh, and the selection effect, which comes about through compositional changes that are induced by workers leaving and entering employment. And I will come back to that a little bit later, and it will become a little bit clearer. Now, what is the problem? Uh, well, the problem is, like basically everything in applied economics, it's an identification problem. Uh, and the identification problem means that in cross-sectional data, we basically compare populations at two different points in time. Of course, the estimated effect of immigration on regional wages or employment may well be a parameter of interest. And it is, uh, in many contexts, an important parameter of interest. However, it does not inform on whether regional wages of employed native workers decrease or whether regional wage responses are due to a change in the composition of native employment. We cannot distinguish between those two composites of the overall effect. Now, repeated cross-sectional data, therefore, do not allow for the estimation of labor demand elasticities of the underlying demand supply framework, which is the canonical model underlying much of the empirical research on the impact of migration. But they confound movements of the labor supply curve down the demand curve with compositional effects that are induced by worker movements. 
And over the next 30 minutes, I will take you uh, through that a little bit more in detail. So what do we contribute in this paper? Well, we provide a unifying framework on the estimation uh, of supply-induced immigration effects. Uh, we provide a novel decomposition of the regional effects into its components, and we translate that into a statistical model to clarify the identification assumptions that are needed for estimation. And I will, we will illustrate the implications using a policy experiment in Germany in 1990, about which I will talk a little bit more in detail later on. Now, let's just consider again, uh, as a starting point, the canonical model. Canonical model is extremely simple. Uh, we have a labor market uh, which consists of workers. Uh, I here don't distinguish between workers of different types, but that is uh, a straightforward uh, extension. And we have capital in this economy. Uh, production uh, is uh, with constant returns to scale. Uh, let's consider this economy in equilibrium. Equilibrium, the labor market, is where the labor supply curve uh, is uh, crossing the labor demand curve. We have an initial wage, and we have native employment uh, before immigration happens. Now migrants are entering the country. Uh, the supply curve shifts down the labor demand curve. Uh, and uh, the final wage in this particular way uh, in which this is drawn uh, will be lower than the initial wage. Uh, depending on labor supply elasticities of natives, uh, employment may respond uh, as well. Uh, and the two effects that are usually uh, attempted to be estimated in research are the wage effects of immigration and the employment effects of immigration. Uh, now, uh, the slope of uh, the labor supply curve uh, is the labor uh, corresponds to the labor supply elasticity. The slope of the wage, uh, uh, the, the, the slope of the labor demand curve is uh, the late wage elasticity uh, of labor demand. The two parameters to be estimated here are denoted by eta and by one over psi. Uh, now, what uh, the parameters which are estimated uh, in or which we need to identify those underlying parameters of this structure uh, are beta r, which is the regional employment effect, and gamma p, which is the price effect of immigration. Now, gamma p, uh, I will show you, can only be identified from repeated cross sections under very strong and implausible assumptions. OK, let's turn to employment. And let's see what we usually estimate. Uh, and let's do that in a very simple framework. So we have two periods here, a pre-period and a post-period, that very much corresponds to the particular experiment uh, which we have um, when we uh, bring this uh, consideration to the data. So we have an immigration shock, which we here assume is strictly exogenous, which can be achieved by appropriate instrumentation. Uh, the estimation equation uh, regresses uh, the change in native workers employed in a particular region uh, between period zero and period one, which is well denoted here as ER1 minus ER0 divided by ER0. And we regress that uh, just to simplify things on a constant, uh, on the immigration shock, and on uh, a residual uh, delta ER. I have denoted everything already in differences, uh, which eliminates permanent region-specific shocks, which is typically done in this literature. So this is kind of, uh, in a nutshell, the typical uh, estimation equation in the literature uh, using repeated cross-sections when we are after employment effect of immigration. The parameter beta r is the effect of immigration on regional native employment, and it addresses the question how much native employment changes in the region which is hit by the immigration shock relative to unaffected regions. It is not informative about whether immigration endangers the jobs of employed natives directly exposed to the immigration shock, which was the first question uh, I asked on my second uh, slide. Now, let's take uh, the thing, uh, this, this, this object on the left-hand side, which I have circled 
uh, with a red square. Let's de decompose that a little bit. So, uh, as I said, it's the change in individuals employed in the region uh, between two periods. First period before the immigration shock, second period after the immigration shock. So we can decompose that into three terms. First of all, uh, a displacement term. Displacement term is the share of individuals who were employed in a particular region before immigration happened and who are not employed in region one. So that kind of very much corresponds to the first question I had on my second slide, right? However, there are two additional effects. The first one is effect number two, which is the crowding out effect. That is the share of individuals who work in period one in region R, but who were not employed in that region in the base period. So these are individuals who are entering a particular regional labor market between period zero and period one. And if they leave the labor market, obviously that effect, uh, or do not enter the labor market, that effect will be negative, or that term will be negative. Not talking about effects here. The third one is the reallocation effect. It's the share of individuals who were employed in period zero in region R, but who moved in period one to employment in another region R bar. So the left hand side uh, term, so the regional, uh, the, the, the term, the left hand side variable uh, estimating uh, the regional impact of migration consists on, of three terms, a displacement effect, a, crowding, a, a displacement term, a crowding out term, and a reallocation term. Now what we have here is an identity, so that means if we regress the left hand side on the immigration shock and each of the terms of, on the right hand side on the immigration shock, the three terms on the right hand side, the parameter estimates, will, end, will add up uh, to the regional effect. And I will show you that decomposition a little bit further down the line. Now, before I do that, let's just consider wages. Uh, similar considerations hold for wages. There are some additional complexities. So if we uh, kind of follow the regional approach, what we, what we are actually doing is we are comparing the wages of employed natives in period zero, I'll call that here log WR zero, with the wages of employed natives in period one. I call that here log WR one. So it's this average wage with this average wage. We take the difference and relate that to the strength of the immigration shock. But you will immediately see that there is an issue here. So the population, the working population on which this average wage or mean wage is based is a different one from the population on which this wage is based. The way I have drawn that here, I have basically um, drawn that in a way that employment in both periods is the same. However, the composition of the workforce has changed. Some people as a response potentially of the immigration shock have left employment. This is the orange area here. And others have uh, been added to the workforce. That means we could see wage effects from period zero to period one, which are not in any way uh, related to shift down the labor demand curve, but which are purely related to a change in the composition of the workforce in period one relative to period zero. Now, to make that a little bit clearer, uh, let's do that a little bit more um, formally. Uh, the typical uh, regional uh, effect of immigration is, uh, wage effect of immigration is identified uh, using uh, the upper um, equation here, uh, where the change in wages is regressed on the immigration shock. Uh, gamma R is the effect of immigration on regional wages, as I pointed out, uh, and it is uh, given uh, by this uh, object here. Let's consider uh, the difference in conditional uh, expectations in red. Uh, and let's do something similar to what we did uh, for employment, namely decompose that in its various components. Now, the first component then is the wage change 
uh, of individuals who are employed in both periods. In the graph I've shown you before, that would have been the two uh, blue uh, areas in period zero and in period uh, one. Now, uh, the second uh, and third um, uh, uh, terms are wedge changes uh, through compositional changes. Uh, the second term, wedge changes through outflows, and the third term, wedge changes uh, through inflows. The first term regressed, or the first term, the parameter, uh, if we take the derivative of the first term with respect to the immigration shock, identifies what we call the price effect of immigration, which is the effect when moving down the labor supply curve, the, uh, the, the uh, moving the labor supply curve down the labor demand curve under very mild assumptions. The second and third term in that respect are basically selection effects. Selection effects which affect the mean wage in the second period and which are induced by natives moving into the workforce in that region or moving out of the workforce. Now, if we want to understand the underlying structural parameters, what we need to uh, obtain is an estimate of the price effect, which uh, requires uh, data which follows individuals over time. Uh, as I said, um, the regional effect, we call this parameter gamma R, and the individual price effect, we call the parameter gamma P, which can be obtained uh, um, basically uh, under very mild assumptions uh, when we have um, longitudinal data. Now, let me talk about the empirical uh, application. This is based uh, on uh, something which happened uh, in Germany just after the fall of the Iron Curtain. Some of you may still remember that Germany uh, after the Second World War was divided into two parts, very much like uh, Korea uh, is still uh, today, uh, the East part and the West part, uh, the East part, part of the uh, empire of the Soviet Union, the West part, uh, part of the uh, Western uh, uh, Western Hemisphere. Um, now, uh, that changed in 1989 when Germany uh, was uh, reunited. Uh, and that was actually a very dramatic year. Uh, I remember that very well. There was a lot of uh, hope, a lot of uh, optimism around the world uh, that everything will now change uh, to the better. The Cold War was basically over. Uh, and uh, well, countries which were hidden behind the Iron Curtain uh, all of a sudden uh, became a part of uh, a global economy and a global world. Among them, uh, the Czech uh, Republic, which bordered Germany, um, in, uh, which, which bordered Germany, the eastern part of Germany, but also the western part of Germany. Now, uh, in the wake of that enthusiasm, uh, there was a lot of attempt to help countries which were hidden away behind the Iron Curtain and where the economic situation was quite dire compared uh, to Western uh, economies. Now, uh, as a result, from January 1991, uh, a commuting scheme uh, was uh, announced uh, and uh, implemented, uh, which allowed Czechs who were living in the Czech Republic uh, to obtain work permits to work in West German districts, which were close to the Czech border, so approximately up to 80 kilometers away from the border. Uh, and uh, these were about 21 eligible districts, which were divided in uh, more than 200 uh, municipalities. Uh, Czechs had to commute. They could not uh, live in uh, Germany, uh, and they were also not allowed to live or to work in any other districts uh, further away from the border. So basically, an experiment not dissimilar to David Card's Marial boat lift. Um, there were no restrictions on the type of work, and the scheme was part of a larger policy that was aimed at making it easier for non-Germans to work in Germany. Similar schemes applied to Polish uh, uh, workers along the Polish-East German border, which we don't uh, uh, investigate here. So let me just give you that a little bit more uh, detailed. 
this area here is Germany. The dark gray area is former East Germany. Uh, and the blue area are the districts uh, into which Czech workers were allowed to commute uh, from the Czech Republic. The light blue areas are those areas which we have chosen based on their characteristics uh, as uh, control areas, which are very similar to those areas in dark blue here, but which did not experience at all any influx of Czech uh, workers. Now, this is just to illustrate that this policy led to a very large, unexpected and exogenous inflow of Czechs into the border region. You see that the policy was implemented, as I just said earlier, in 1990, but by 1992, uh, about 3% uh, of employment in the dark blue areas I have shown you before, uh, where basically Czech nationals, that increased to 10% uh, if we move very close to the border. Uh, and the further away we go from the border, the smaller that percentage became. Now, um, that is the experiment we use here to investigate the impact of immigration on employment and wages. Uh, employment spells in the border district uh, are um, basically covering the pre-policy period uh, between 87 uh, and 1990, and then the post period between 1990 and 1995. All workers who were employed in the border district as of June 30, 1990 are uh, considered, and we follow those workers uh, over the entire period, regardless of whether they are employed. We can distinguish checks because in the employment records, and I should have said this is administrative data which follows the population uh, and covers the population. Um, now, uh, we can identify Czech workers because their nationality is recorded in these administrative records. We augment the sample by individuals who were not employed as of June 1990, uh, but had last employment spells in a border or control district. And why we do that uh, will become clearer a little bit further down my presentation. Uh, now, um, Identification follows basically two designs here. One is because of the commuting requirement, working away further from the border becomes increasingly um, becomes increasingly costly. So the distance from the border is therefore uh, one instrument. Uh, the second one uh, we use is basically we match inland control regions that did not experience an inflow of Czech workers. Again, that is similar to the Mariel boat lift map. Um, so let's come straight uh, to uh, employment. Remember on the upper right side uh, of my slide, uh, I have basically the decomposition of uh, the regional effect into its different components. And let's start with the regional effect. So we basically regress that term, uh, the regional employment effect on uh, the change, uh, on the immigration shock. Uh, between 1990 and 1992. Uh, well, in the pre-period, uh, before 1990, you can see that's basically the placebo. You can see nothing really happens. But when uh, the border opens, there is a sharp drop uh, in employment, uh, which is actually pretty large in magnitude. So by 1993, a 10 percentage point increase in the inflow of Czech workers uh, has decreased local native employment by 8.7%. This is a large effect. Now, there are reasons why it is so large, but I will not go into details uh, at this point. Well, now let's ask a different question. What happens to workers who have been employed when the immigration shock happened? So this is the displacement effect, which very often uh, is what people have in mind when they think about employment effects of immigration. And that effect is actually very small. A 10 percentage point increase in the inflow of Czech workers between 1990 and 1992 decreases employment probabilities of natives uh, employed in the area uh, by just 1.5%. And that effect 
is not even uh, statistically less significant anymore in 1995 when it is actually close to zero. So a very large difference uh, between uh, those two uh, employment effects, which address very different questions. Uh, now that was already on my second slide. Let's try to find out what's the uh, reason for that. So why are these effects so different? Well, uh, the main reason lies in the crowding out effects. Uh, and that is the green line here. The green line uh, basically measures uh, non-inflows into a particular region as a result of immigration from either other regions or from non-employment. So that's very important. Non-happening inflows into those regions explain the difference between the regional effect and the displacement effect. And the reallocation effect by actually uh, individuals uh, from the affected region moving to other regions, which has been very much discussed uh, in an older literature uh, on immigration, uh, where some claimed these effects are very large, others uh, these effects are uh, not so large. Uh, actually, the reallocation effect is very modest uh, and not significant at all. So the main difference between the regional and the displacement effect is basically due to crowding out. Now, we can uh, do that uh, in terms of tables to decompose that a little bit more. Here again, we have the regional effect and the displacement effect, uh, the crowding out effect, which explains the majority uh, of difference between uh, column one uh, and column two. Uh, well, there is no limit how much we can now re uh, or, or, or further decompose these different effects. And we learn a lot about the dynamics of uh, migration by actually doing that, the outflow uh, or the displacement effect can be further decomposed into individuals being employed in the same region or in other regions. So displacement uh, is basically mainly reducing employment uh, in the same uh, region, uh, not so much uh, outflows into other regions. Uh, the crowding out effect, uh, on the other hand, uh, is mainly driven by inflows from non-employment uh, to two-thirds uh, and to one-third by not happening inflows uh, from employment in other regions. And that uh, effect can then be re uh, further uh, um, uh, decomposed uh, into uh, regions, uh, into inflows from non-employment from other regions, from the same region and from entry. Uh, now, I need to move on, uh, but details are given uh, in our paper. Let's kind of come to wages. So let's start again with the regional wage effect. And you see that in this graph, again, the placebo, uh, uh, this kind of an event type histogram here, um, the uh, diagram here, the, the, the placebo again suggests nothing happens in the pre-period, but very little happens in the post-period uh, as well. So this is what you would obtain if you would use the regional approach uh, to estimate the wage effect. So the regional wage effect is small and insignificant. Now, let's see what happens if we um, kind of decompose that further and we estimate the price effect. The price effect is the blue line. And the price effect is actually, uh, well, kicking in straight after the policy has been uh, implemented. Uh, and uh, it is larger and significant, a 10 percentage point increase in immigration reduces wages of incumbent workers by 1.5%, uh, which uh, has an implied wage elasticity of labor demand of 1.47. Now, um, this effect is very modest. If we put that uh, in, uh, in conjunction with the overall wage increase over that period, uh, which has been very dramatic. So over three, four years, wages increased in real terms by close to 20%. Uh, this was a period when wages were still increasing, uh, very different uh, from what we experience today. So uh, the wage effect, uh, uh, the, 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 the price effect uh, being significant, relatively small in magnitude, and the modest wage response is actually explained by the relatively large native employment elasticity. So uh, 
employment reduction uh, always leads uh, to a reduction in the wage effect uh, because uh, basically if natives leave the labor market, the local labor market, then wages uh, will uh, come uh, less under pressure. So what explains the difference between these two effects? Well, again, uh, it is a composition effect and the composition effect in this case uh, is positive. Remember, this was uh, basically uh, the two areas which I have shown you in the initial graph. Uh, we show in the paper that changes in composition actually improve wages in the region and that is mainly driven by positive selection uh, of inflows. Positive selection of inflows which overcompensates negative uh, selection of uh, outflows. Uh, to uh, show you that a little bit more in detail, again, uh, 1993 versus 1990, we can decompose that a little bit further. The regional wage effect is basically null. Uh, the price effect uh, is uh, larger. Uh, the composition uh, effect is the main explanatory uh, part, which explains the difference between the regional wage effect and the price effect. And as I said earlier, it is kind of, um, uh, well, it has an inflow component and an outflow component. The outflow component is smaller than the inflow component, uh, and the inflow component uh, is uh, leading to an increase uh, in regional wages because inflows uh, are positively uh, selected. Uh, age selection is something I don't have much time to talk about now. Now we can then also distinguish uh, between different skill groups. So we can do that by skill groups. Uh, are uh, the uh, responses of different skill groups, are the price effects of different skill groups uh, similar or do they uh, differ uh, dramatically? And how does that compare to the regional wage effects? Well, this is done uh, in this table. Let's just focus on the first panel. Uh, and you can see that the price effects are actually very similar for unskilled natives than they are for skilled natives. However, the regional wage effects uh, are quite uh, different. Um, so that is related to changes in the composition. The changes in the composition are different uh, for individuals uh, of a different skill level. Now, another interesting thing you um, or which is very often not considered uh, in this literature is how actually these price and employment effects affect different groups uh, of workers. So one important group uh, of workers are actually workers who are not employed when the immigration shock happens. So workers who are not employed when the immigration shock happens are workers who are, so to say, outsiders. They are outside the labor market if now an immigration shock happens, uh, the labor market situation for them may deteriorate uh, because, well, they still have to compete for jobs they don't have at a particular point in time uh, with uh, immigrants, which is different for insiders uh, who uh, may be uh, in a far better bargaining position than outsiders. In particular, in very uh, regulated labor markets, uh, such as the German labor market at the time of this analysis. Uh, and well, actually, um, this uh, estimates of the price effects. Uh, now, how do we do that? Let me just say something about that very briefly. With longitudinal data, you can actually uh, construct a sample of individuals who are not in employment when the immigration shock happened, but who have been in employment earlier. So these are individuals who are potentially coming back to the labor market. You can compute them for areas or regions which have been differently impacted by the uh, immigration shock. And you can impute their potential wages at the point when migration happens by using past wages and predicting them uh, further into the future. So you can basically uh, draw the difference between the wages these individuals, if they then enter the labor market, into affected areas by migration and non-affected areas compared to those wages which they would get uh, had um, 
uh, basically uh, their wage profile followed the wage profile we would have predicted based on their historical wages. And if we do that, uh, what we see is that the 10 percentage points increase in immigration reduces the wages of previously non-employed natives by about 7.1% uh, or 8.9% depending on what year we are looking at, which compares to the effects I have you shown you uh, before, which are far smaller for continuously employed workers. Similarly, uh, the displacement effects uh, are also larger uh, for non-employed workers. Now, Jiang Min is very strict with the timing, uh, and I think I will use the last minutes uh, to simply uh, wrap up. So what do we conclude from all that? Well, first of all, it's very important, not just in this literature, not just in a literature uh, of the type uh, I have uh, discussed in uh, this presentation, but in all applied work that we are very, very clear about what is the exact question of interest and what is exactly what the parameters identify that we estimate in our empirical application. And that is very often not necessarily the same. So we have to be very clear about what questions we want to address and very clear about what the parameters answer in terms of questions which we, in the end, basically estimate. So the example here for employment, uh, coming back to uh, what I had on my second slide, what is the impact of immigration on workers who are employed in the region when immigration happens? And what is the impact of immigration on regional employment can have very different answers. Now, similar considerations I have shown you uh, are there for the effects of immigration on wages. Uh, the regional effect of immigration identifies uh, the price effect uh, that follows from the canonical model only under very strong assumptions. Longitudinal data, on the other hand, allow identification under that effect, uh, of that effect under far less restrictive assumptions. I haven't spoken, I haven't talked much about that by, because I didn't have much time, uh, but um, I have shown you the difference between those two effects. You can kind of um, translate uh, those insights to other literatures uh, which use um, repeated cross-sectional uh, data to identify uh, regional effects. Uh, now, um, you can uh, well ask similar questions for other outcomes uh, in the economics uh, of migration, um, and you will uh, again, uh, see that uh, while there may be uh, real identification problems uh, in answering very particular questions you may be interested in if uh, only repeated cross-sectional data uh, is available. Okay, I think I stop here. Um, I hope you are all still there because the only thing I am seeing here is myself and uh, the slides and I have no idea uh, what else uh, is going on. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We are all here. <laughs> okay. okay. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent talk. Uh, I found a lot. Uh, so uh, we are still waiting for questions. Uh, in the meantime, then I'm going to ask some questions. So first of all, uh, uh, labor demand uh, after you open the border to check, uh, was there any uh, change in labor demand, do you think? For example, I can imagine, uh, for example, like a new Czech restaurants are open. They see some business opportunities there. Uh, do you consider that in your estimation or yeah, that's that's. I think that's an excellent point, and it's also relating to something I didn't have much time to talk about. So when you think about the diagram I showed you a little bit earlier, uh, this is a diagram where you just focus on the labor market. You assume in that diagram that labor demand is basically uh, not shifting because of demand shifts in consumed goods. 
However, the typical situation we have is that immigrants immigrate into a particular area and they want to eat what they are used to and they also need to live somewhere and they also need to drink something and they also need hospitality, et cetera, et cetera. So they increase demand in those areas, uh, which is something hardly ever considered in the literature. There were some macro papers who look at that. Now, the beauty of the particular uh, shock uh, we have available here is that this is a commuting policy. So the Czechs who come during the day to Germany uh, to work have to return in the evening uh, to uh, the Czech Republic. So they are in all likelihood do not take uh, much advantage of restaurants uh, in the western part of Germany or consume other consumption goods, which anyway, at that particular point in time, uh, because of the huge purchasing power differences, have been much cheaper uh, in the Czech Republic. So this is kind of a, a relatively, I think, as pure as you get a labor supply shock, which is not uh, convoluted by the type of demand, um, demand uh, uh, considerations uh, which we usually have uh, uh, when we look at immigration shocks uh, and, and, and that you just mentioned. Okay, uh, Ming Hai Zhou uh, ask a question. When conducting further decomposing component of a displacement effect into employed in other regions, what is the difference of this component with the term of the outflows to other regions in the initial decomposition? Can you look at that question? Uh, yes. Um, the, the, it's quite complicated. Uh, it's a complicated question. I think this question mm -hmm. is a little bit more complicated than what I was trying to say in my talk. Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to answer it nevertheless. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think one uh, one remarkable insight we got by doing this work um, is how important inflows are. Um, so, of course, employment always is a huge turnover in employment from period to period, which we often don't actually realize. Um, but how important inflows are for um, explaining the regional effect of immigration, as I shown you um, a little bit earlier in, in, in the tables. Um, the regional effect has been quite dramatic. However, this is not because workers who are in employment uh, are losing their jobs, which is the way we think about immigration shocks on employment usually. It's not because of that. It is because workers don't uh, flow into employment in that region what they would have otherwise done if the immigration shock would not have happened. And these workers come from non-employment uh, and uh, had I have more time, I could also show you results by, by age groups, uh, very often uh, younger workers who would have entered the labor market but don't do so because of the immigration shock. And many of those actually follow um, a further education. Uh, and uh, that also happens by workers from other regions who don't come uh, to work in the region which has been experiencing uh, an immigration shock. So that uh, non-happening inflow uh, from those two uh, origins is extremely important to explain, at least in our application, a very large part of um, that particular, uh, uh, what we call the regional effect uh, of immigration. It's not workers who are losing employment. Uh, also, there is one particular group which is uh, very much affected uh, in terms of uh, transiting into non-employment, and this, these are workers who are above the age of 55. Um, for them, uh, the displacement effect is large and significant, uh, and that is most likely due to them uh, going into early retirement. But for other groups, uh, this is uh, simply not uh, happening. Um, what we also don't see is this displacement effect, which has, as I said earlier, been very much discussed in an earlier literature, and that is workers actually leaving the region uh, to seek employment in other regions as a result of the immigration shock. That seems to be a relatively, uh, a relatively minor phenomenon 
uh, as well. So what really matters is inflows that would have happened uh, in the absence of the immigration shock, but don't happen uh, because of the immigration shock. So how much I hope that answers to some extent that question? Yeah. Yeah. If the answer is not sufficient, the police uh, uh, ask a follow up question uh, being high. Uh, yes. So how much of that decrease in the inflow would be because of the change in living stand, living environment. So do you see any increase in the crime rate, for example? Uh, that is not something we are able to look at in um, this particular paper. Mm. So we, 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 yeah, we, we couldn't, we couldn't look at, um, uh, yeah, that's not some. I mean, yeah. So, so, yeah. Uh, no, we we didn't we didn't uh, look. I mean, crime and immigration, of course, is 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 another uh, interesting and important topic. I I wouldn't think. I mean, these are people who come for for work, and and uh, I would I would find it very odd if there was anything uh, related to crime, and and we don't have the data to 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 look at that. So, uh, mm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Of course, they are yeah. just a commuting. So I think less likely. Yeah. Uh, however, uh, I mean the evidence on mm. crime and immigration is very thin anyway. So um, yes, mm -hmm. I, I I don't think. Uh, also, um, some political quarters claim that the evidence I have seen is 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 actually not going in that direction. And if there is anything uh, which suggests that immigration is related to crime rates, then this is usually uh, because of demographic effects. So yes. we know that crime is a phenomenon uh, of mainly young men. Mm -hmm. uh, crime rates uh, peak between the age of 19 and 21 uh, in in all countries. Uh, now, uh, Jiang Min and I are both not really endangered anymore to follow a, a career of crime because we are far too old for that. But very uh, young men, teenagers, are usually um, uh, those who, 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 who are most uh, uh, falling in that category, and 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 of course, immigration is demographically a very young phenomenon. Mm. So it changes the demographics. Uh, mm. And if uh, papers have found any uh, crime effects, then this is usually due uh, to uh, demographic changes, uh, but not uh, because those uh, who come conditional on demographics are more criminal uh, than natives. Yeah, but even if it's not true. Uh, I think there exists uh, some misconception among people uh, about foreign uh, uh, immigrant workers, especially. Um, yes, I mean, like everything surrounding migration, migration mm -hmm. and crime is also something which uh, um, suits the agenda uh, of, um, well, particular, mainly populist, uh, political political groups and and it is something which um, and it's actually our uh, it is our um, uh, it it is up to us uh, to shed light on all these issues and uh, right. put mm -hmm. bring the facts out there uh, mm -hmm. to avoid uh, that uh, arguments are brought in the political uh, debate which have no substance whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that that's uh, basically what what uh, what is uh, one of our, the main um, duties we have as, as 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 academics. Now I see there is another question. Yes. Yeah. Could there be heterogeneity in the effect in the effect depending on the economic situation of the country, if the country is in recession or in economic prosperity? So I actually have a related question because uh, the the time period you're looking at is re after reunification. I, I think there was a macroeconomic uh, uh, effect, uh, the direct effect of reunification. So I think it is related to this question. Yeah. Did so you, that's uh, a very mm -hmm. both very good question. So let me start with uh, Jiang Min's. Um, of course, as long as the macroeconomic situation is not affected by 
immigration in the sense that it affects control and treatment regions differently, that doesn't matter for the identification design. Mm -hmm. However, the question um, Siva is asking uh, is of course very important and it's also related to Jiang Min's question. So, so uh, the impact of migration on any outcomes is certainly not something which we can generalize. It differs for the same country according to the particular immigration shock we are seeing, composition of immigrants. It differs according to the economic cycle. It differs according to uh, the native demographic structure. It certainly differs across countries. So uh, if there are many things we can actually, uh, I remember the Minza wage equation when it was estimated the first time on East German data, uh, Jacob Minzer, who was still alive at that time, was very pleased because the coefficients on education and experience were very similar to what we have actually found for all other countries. So that's something we can uh, generalize or we have generalized. However, the impact of migration uh, on outcomes of natives is certainly something which very much depends on particular, very particular situations and generalizations would be very misguided. Uh, mm -hmm. So I certainly would not uh, recommend to do that. And of course, this is a very particular situation mm -hmm. uh, and a very particular immigration shock. Uh, and well, uh, this doesn't speak to uh, migration from the Philippines to Korea or migration from India to Singapore or whatever. So there we need uh, analysis which looks uh, into detail uh, and uh, investigates that more in detail. But it's a very nice experiment uh, to clarify some of the more substantive questions uh, we are asking in this paper. Uh, and that uh, relates to what is it actually, what we identify with different types of data. Okay, Pramod uh, asked a question, although it may not be directly related to this particular research, are new farms coming to this area to take advantage of these groups of workers? Yeah, this is a very good question as well. Now, the commuting policy, uh, as you may have noticed from one of the first graphs, kind of um, came to an end pretty, pretty quickly. And, and one, one, one of the reasons was concern of um, uh, yeah, worker associations that actually there may be an issue um, with those inflows. So after three, four years, uh, these commuting policies were made much more difficult. That's why we focus uh, only on the initial period. Um, and that didn't give firms much time to take advantage of that. We are now mm -hmm. working on something which looks at firms a little bit more in detail. But more generally, um, this policy was relatively short term, probably also expected by firms not to continue for, for a very long time. And if you look at the structure of industries, structure of firms, uh, we haven't seen in the data uh, large changes as a response to this immigration shock. But that doesn't mean that that doesn't happen uh, for other immigration situations. We, 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 we do know that that, that industry structure uh, is responding uh, to uh, immigration. There are papers which show that we also know that technology uh, implementation is responding to the availability of whatever type of labor uh, may be uh, accessible. So, so clearly, um, not in this case, uh, not in the data we have, uh, but certainly uh, something important in other migration situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, I, I totally agree that uh, we cannot generalize our particular findings, but you know, accumulating more and more evidence from particular uh, cases, I think we are gaining more general uh, insights about this issue. Uh, and uh, this paper is, uh, in that sense, I think very uh, helpful for uh, the uh, making uh, the, the policies uh, in the future about immigration. So thank you, uh, Christian. Uh, Thank you for your excellent uh, uh, research uh, presentation and also uh, excellent 
uh, service uh, in, in the past few years as the president of the ASLA. Uh, I promise I will continue, try to continue our good tradition of high academic standard uh, as you did. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jiangmin, and thanks uh, everybody for supporting uh, the society. So I'm sure uh, this will uh, be, uh, well, I think in, in, in a short time, it will be probably the largest society for labor economics, given the amazing potential of growth uh, in the Asian, Australasian uh, region. Uh, and I'm looking forward to many more conferences, hopefully face to face uh, and uh, many more uh, innovations this society will bring about. Thanks a lot. Sure. Thank you very much. Okay, so this is the end of the session, uh, presidential address. Thank you very, uh, very much for everybody. Thank you, Christian. Thanks, Jungmin. See you. Bye-bye. <laughs> sure. All right.